developing extreme fits of rage. Do not hesitate to contact your local health officials. Keep your children out of sight. Hi, this is a state of emergency. This message will repeat. I don't Why are there so many cars outside? Well, it's a big hotel and I think there's a gala happening to help with doctors and hospitals with everyone getting sick. <laughs> so distracted by my anger. The last thing I want is for Kelly to see us like this. I know I've got things to work on, and it's not fair to you, and it's not fair to her. I want us to try to be a family together. It started. And hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to another edition of Takeover Tuesday, live from Italy. This is Takeover <laughs> Tuesday, Black Bond Distro. Uh, I've always wanted to say that on the air. Um, we're here with the amazingly talented uh, Francisco Giannini. Uh, Francisco, thanks uh, so much for taking over Instagram today. Uh, you guys went to town. Uh, I, I can't remember seeing that much content posted in a day on our Instagram uh, uh, throughout all hours of the day because right now you are actually in Italy and I what am. time is it? What time is it it's, over there right now? Yeah, it's 104 a.m. <laughs> so, so for everyone tuning in, you got to throw some questions up because this man yeah. has stayed up all day. Uh, yeah. We had to do the time sequences. We got to, we, we had to figure out kind of, you know, who was where, what time zone we were in, like when are you going to start posting today? Um, yeah. But hey, thanks a lot. Thanks again for joining the show. Uh, it's great to have you on. Um, obviously we're going to be talking a lot about, um, uh, your new movie, Hall, Thank which you. just came out on Black Bond Distribution. It's available now across Canada and all major VOD platforms, as well as HD Digital, iTunes, YouTube, and Google Play. And uh, hey, let's uh, let's 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 dive in. Um, but just before we get started, uh, yes. I should take a step back. Um, for everyone out there, uh, if you have a question uh, for Francisco, just throw it down in the comment section below. If you're watching on uh, Facebook. Uh, so, and what we'll do is we'll try and get your questions on the screen uh, during the broadcast and, and get some answers for you. Of course, we've got some hard-hitting journalistic questions coming up over the next forty or forty-five minutes. And uh, hey, let's uh, let's jump right in, man. How you doing? Uh, how are, how's life in? Uh, I, I gotta say, I, I know I'm gonna save a, I'm gonna save a surprise for later on. But but uh, oh, how you doing? How's Italy? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's uh, it's truly a blessing to be here. Uh, honestly, uh, it's been a great. Uh, you know, a great time just working on this personal film of mine that I've been working on for the last year. And to be able to shoot it during COVID, um, it's, it was, honestly, I wasn't sure if we were going to shoot it anymore. We had delayed it for at least six months uh, over and over and over just because of the situation. And finally, we said, you know what, we, we don't know when this COVID, when this uh, pandemic is going to end. So let's just go, let's just go do it. So I got here a few months ago in preparation for the film. Uh, in December, and ever since December, since December, I've been here just preparing, 
scouting locations, getting the crews together, figuring out all the, you know, the logistics uh, to shoot this film during COVID. And uh, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy, but because it's such a personal film and working in, you know, um, a town where my, my father, my grandfather, and basically all my whole Italian heritage is from, it's been, uh, it makes it that much, that much, uh, you know, much more, uh, you know, uh, personal. And, and honestly, it's, uh, it's, it's surreal. The experience is surreal, but at the same time, I've been here many times before to visit as a, as a, you know, visiting my family over the, the last 15, 20 years. So it's, it's like a second home for me. Uh, and I really got close to the town this time around. I got a chance to explore the things I haven't seen, you know, where when I was a kid, when I used to come here, and uh, just the, the the you know the friendships of my father, the family members, the culture itself, uh, the people of the town, uh, they've been so helpful. The community, uh, everybody's been supportive. It's honestly, it's it's an amazing experience. I never, uh, I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be here for work ever in a million years, and uh, it, it became a reality. In the last year, it's become a reality, and I'm enjoying every moment. Uh, so now we just we just completed production um a few days ago so i'm still recuperating <laughs> it was uh, yeah, like said, yeah yeah it was it was a heavy shoot because it was a small crew because of covid we couldn't have there was so many restrictions so we didn't want to have a huge crew to cast a lot of limitations but we managed to pull it off and uh, we have something really special and we're really happy and i'm still here now so all the crew everybody's gone and uh they all left yesterday uh, most of them kind of finished leaving yesterday and i stayed back to uh basically uh, rest and recuperate. So. <laughs> <laughs> now originally no. like you you were going yeah. over to visit over the over the uh, over the holidays uh, uh, were, yes. were you were you planning yes. to come back to Canada and then go back over to Italy originally or and then because of covid you just stayed yeah. over there or Yeah, it, it, exactly. We were not sh I wasn't sure if I was going to come back. It was a possibility that I was going to come back and then of course if the shoot was going to be pushed again or uh, I was going to fly back but like you said all the the restrictions and all the situation back home and and you know uh, it was going to cause a lot more co confusion me coming back home now than uh, just staying here and and continue working on the project and also building working relationships here. You know, I've I've met a lot of producers, uh, a lot of companies in uh, in all of all of Italy, and just building those relationships for future projects as well, not just this one I just finished doing. And uh, so I took advantage of that time, and of course I, I visited family, so I took advantage. It was it became personal and work at the same time. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. But it's like I said, it's been a hell of a a hell of an experience to shoot something for you know in another country. It's it's definitely you know I had one per, I had one a crew member which was my director of photography who worked on Hall uh, right. come down come down for the film. He flew down. Uh, he stayed with me. We had a place together, so he had to quarantine when he got here. Uh, it was just, just to get him was so complicated because of all the restrictions. So I wanted to bring other people as well. There was, there was some, the cast that was supposed to come from Montreal and I just couldn't, I couldn't afford it and I couldn't take a risk. So, but luckily he came and, uh, we, cause we've worked together before. So I had someone that was, I was familiar with that I could work together with and allowed us to flow through the days, the production schedule quickly, the shot list. And uh, it was a, yeah, it was a blessing to have him here. Luckily, if he wasn't here, I wouldn't have been able to execute the film the way I did because I was working with all, you know, people from Italy and crews from Italy, which were all outstanding. But I never worked with them before, so it was uh, yeah. yeah, it was it was getting used to that. So so Graham made that much that that's that experience a lot more easier for me. And uh, yeah, so uh, I just yeah, like I said, I decided to stay and take it as a personal trip at the same time professional altogether. Yeah. And it's funny, like you mentioned, the uh, uh, the um, um, you know working with people uh, again for the second, maybe third time. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's sort of like that. Uh, you don't have to communicate as much, right? You kind of know what you, what uh, oh, yeah. each other person, what, what the other person needs, and what they require, what they're yeah. thinking. And not all the time, obviously. I mean, no, nobody's like you know, nobody's psychic or anything. Yeah. But but it's really that kind of that, that shorthand, right? Like when, while you're on set, that saves a whole bunch of time. You probably oh, get more God. more shots yeah. and more stuff in there, right? Um, yeah, was great. That, were you working? Was, was sorry. Was and I, my question was like, was that was was working on Hall? Um, uh, was that the first film you worked with uh, with Graham? Uh, Graham, no, Graham. Actually, I worked with him on uh, a film we did right before, which was called Woodland Gray, uh, which I just I was just executive producer producer on that project. So I basically 
uh, we scouted DOPs for 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 Adam Ryder, who's the director of Woodland Gray in 2000 and uh, end of two, or beginning of 2018, I think it was. We started scouting DPs for his film, and Graham was one of the list on the list, and uh, we met him. So we met like we made like a uh, a top five list that he wanted to work with, and I presented some of the demo reels that came in as CVs that came into the the account, and I sent it to him, and and Graham was amongst one of them. So he, we met with him. Love his work ethics. I saw him on set, so I, I, I initially saw him as a as a producer, right? As a, not as a director, working hand in hand with him. I saw his work ethics. I just saw the way he was on set. I saw the results, and I liked his his attitude. I liked his his way of working. And uh, immediately, I said, "Do you want to come and do Hall with me?" Which was a few months later. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, actually, Hall came out before Woodline for different many reasons. But uh, yeah, so he he was outstanding. He was outstanding. So we got we built a really strong relationship right away from Woodland, uh, and then it just kind of you know uh, you know went towards uh, Hall right after. And um, he yeah he's it's, like I said he's his work ethics. He's not just talented. He's just like you said. It's just knowing each other and knowing what I want and I know what he's thinking and we're 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 we're, we're synced when we're working together and allows us to flow through the days uh, you know. Uh, quickly efficiently like we did with hall we did hall in 13 days 12 13 days and every day was on schedule pretty much and we were on the same page and the same with italy like we we prepared beforehand he got here two weeks before we got a couple of days of location scout we did the shot list everything was ready for the shoot so the five days that we had of production we were on the same page every second every second of the way uh definitely that relationship is something special and uh, I, I imagine a lot of directors build relationships with DPs and I would love to do a lot of you know my future films with uh, with Graham if possible so yeah, yeah good, news. I was good, news. good news Graham <laughs> if yeah. you're watching <laughs> <laughs> um, listen yeah. uh, let's 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 dive into Hall then because I mean yeah. uh, obviously the film just came out uh, um, April uh, uh, 6th this this month um, it's available uh, like I mentioned on all uh, major VOD platforms across Canada uh, it's also mm -hmm. going to be released in Japan uh, coming yes. up as well, and uh, other deals in other territories uh, coming soon momentarily, of course. So keep your eyes out for that if you're tuning in from from outside of Canada or I guess outside Japan as well. Um, mm -hmm. But um, you know, this film is um, it was such an interesting film to watch when when we kind of got our hands on it. And yeah. uh, you know, we it, it's funny I should just tell our audience that you know we were supposed to have you. We we're going to try and plan to have you on the set oh, yeah. on the release date, um, but it was just too yeah. crazy with everything going on. Uh, yes. Your shoot getting pushed a little bit, and then you said mm -hmm. to me, "Dude, I, I can do it. Like I, I I'll do it." But yeah. and I said, "You know what? Let's let's wait. Let's wait until you're at least a little bit a little bit less, um, yeah, less busy, because uh, we it all know how that gets, and everything yeah. kind of takes a lot of a little bit more time." But now that we have you on, let's talk yeah. about Hall. Let's talk about. I mean, you filmed this movie was uh, uh, your directorial de debut, uh, or your feature your feature directorial feature. debut, of course. Yes. And we'll get to that in a second, talking about your past work. Um, mm -hmm. But also, one you know, it took a while for it to get to, to get made uh, and, mm -hmm. and and finished and released because of the pandemic. It's yeah. a viral thriller. Um, <laughs> it's about a pandemic happening in a ho hotel. Yes. Um, and that was never that was never planned. And I think I think I wanted no. to lead with that tonight, just because I think a lot of people. We yeah. have seen commentary on that because people are like, "When did you film this?" It feels like you, this, you yeah. filmed this like last week, and it's funny because um, yeah. there are definitely certain things that pop out, and maybe some of the reviews that have come in too that that are that are interesting on how they're positioned. Mm -hmm. But let's go through the history of the Hall. Like this movie came out, um, it, you know, obviously it, it, you won Best Director at the Blood and the Snow Film Festival in Toronto, Ontario, in Canada, um, and that was in, uh, uh, in December, yeah. November, December twenty twenty. Um, mm -hmm. But you had filmed, you'd written this movie uh, with the writers, like you're collectively yep. come together, written the story, okay. and then the script in 2019. Correct. Before Actually, any of us knew what COVID was, right? Yeah. So, so basically, the script came to me in 2018, actually, uh, from Adam Kolodny, uh, one of the writers. Uh, he presented the script to me uh, in 2018, believe it or not. It was, I remember, it was a summer of 2018 because I was traveling on vacation. And I brought a bunch of scripts with me, and I was wondering, <laughs> which script am I going to do? For, which which will be my first directorial debut as a, as a, as a feature film? I had a list, you know, a whole pile of them, and Hall was amongst one of them that that Adam had shared with me, and I read it, and I immediately f fell in love with the the premise. You know, that was the, the the first immediate reaction I had, just the premise and having that, you know, uh, 
you know, one location set up, um, you know, contained environment. I was attracted to it. I really did. I, I, I loved it. I fell in love with it immediately. And, and of course, later, Derek came onto the project as well, uh, going into, let's say, the end of 2018 when we were going through rewrites. Um, so the, the script evolved from the first draft to the last draft. It evolved many times and transformed many times, uh, working together with Adam and Derek. And just because there was, you know, uh, elements of the story that we were trying to figure out if, if you know, we were, first of all, we were all three of us happy, but at the same time, if I was able to, you know, um, bring it to life, you know, like I had some, it went through like transitions where it was a ghost story at one point, and then it became a, a, an action thriller, uh, uh, you know, a suspense and, 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 uh, you know, it went through many different, <laughs> um, different, uh, storylines. So, so we had to eventually, Come, you know, we, we eventually came with the story we have today, and you know, we agreed that this was the best direction we wanted to go. And this was in 2000, I'd say the last draft came out in December 2018, December 2018, wow. and, we and we shot the first month of 2019. So, uh, absolutely, everything was shot before COVID. Uh, so, everything was a complete coincidence i did not see the future uh, derek and, I, and adam did not see the future we were <laughs> we were just working together being creative thinking of ideas things that interested us that, that were interesting to us uh, to explore uh, on a narrative level like with the characters with the storyline um yeah and i can't even i can't remember to be honest i wish uh, i can remember i i believe the, of course the viral it's the the viral uh, environment, the, the situation of the viral was that came first, and then we kind of built the characters. But we took elements of the character from the first first draft, and we kind of mixed it up with the third, fourth draft. And in the end, we had about nine drafts, uh, maybe more, to, to be honest. Uh, of course, Yumiko came in later uh, as well. You right. know, initially, it wasn't there was no Japanese, um, you know, uh, woman in the film. It was just you know, uh, local. You had, you know, American or U.S. Uh, Canadian actors, right? Um, it was there was no there was no foreign uh, uh, element to the story, and that came down later on. So it really evolved. Uh, so many until the last month. Till the last month, we were ch making changes on the script. I, I swear, it was the last month before we shot that we were still, uh, you know, <laughs> making changes, adding, taking out, and finally we got what we what we had. So what, you know, what what Hall ended up being. So it's. Uh, <laughs> And, and, it was and, a, all the journey, yeah. And then he went to camera. So when did you go to camera exactly? Like, like roughly ja for, you know. January. It was January, uh, January two thousand nineteen. Right. Yeah. Okay. So and so, then yeah. And so then, then it was, fin it was finished in. Sorry. So so yeah, because COVID yeah. happened like sorry in the fall of basically the fall of twenty twenty, right? Exactly. No, no, 2019, oh. Sorry, twenty nineteen. Yeah, you're right. And then in, and then it really kind of. Uh, it, took yeah, it took a hold of everyone in 2020, right? Yeah, so so believe it or not, like the film. So we're talking about timing, right? About the whole the whole uh, pandemic during the pandemic. The film was shot in 2000 January 2019. So we had at least a year until January before COVID even started to finish the film, and we couldn't finish the film because of many different reasons: financing and and just post production uh, issues. Uh, you know, mostly related to that. Yeah. And then par, par, par for the course for a first for a first feature film, of course, right? Yeah. Oh my god. Yes. Exactly. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah. Yeah. It and then add a it, pandemic on top of that. Boom. And that was the cherry on the cake, exactly. Because that, as we're coming to towards the end, we were maybe in. I think we were in sound design when COVID hit. We were about to go into sound design, or right before, and then it hit. So it wasn't timed on for any. It was just it just happened at the same time that we were delayed. And mm -hmm. we, we wanted to release the film before 2000, before March 2020, but it just didn't happen by pure coincidence. And we went into the pandemic continuously working on the film until it was complete. So, uh, yeah, so it, it, it definitely is a hell of a coincidence. It just happened that way. Yeah. Um, and it premiered at, it premiered at uh, Aero Video Sprite Fest in England, uh, yes. and, um, which is a yeah. fantastic festival. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, it's funny because I read, um, I was reading some, uh, uh, some reviews on it, and they were saying, yeah. uh, you know, some of this obviously is like right on the money because, uh, because obviously we're going through a pandemic right now, but some stuff mm -hmm. is not uh, because, you know, why wouldn't people be wearing masks? And that was from yes. that was from England, though, right? And I was like, yeah. "Funny, you should mention that because maybe yeah. come to North America." Because at the time when I read that, it, and this was a few yeah. months ago, it's like there was always there's this the anti mask movement, all this stuff, and 
Correct. Yeah, not to go down that rabbit hole, but but it's it's funny. It's just like I don't know what would happen. Like it, it seems so so yeah. true to what's what's going on. And and I just feel it's it's important to mention it too because it's like I know yeah. as as a horror fan and a fan of like you know thrillers mm -hmm. and zombie movies and everything. Um, it's always interesting to think of that end game scenario, right? And and to figure out what, what would you do and putting putting characters into different situations and how to see them get out of it. But obviously, there's right. there's been a lot of uh, uh, criticism on uh, uh, other projects and other other films out there that have been like, well, potentially maybe people are taking taking advantage of that the pandemic scenario and and you know, yeah, doing yeah. exploiting it for 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 personal gain. And and it was funny when I watched this movie, I I I, I was like, wow, this is crazy. I yeah. can't believe how close this is, and then <laughs> yeah. I and then I can't remember who I reached out to. Um, I think it was Colin. Uh, yeah, and I oh. said, "What's the deal with this movie? Like, when was it made? I need to know this stuff." And he kind of gave me the Cole's notes, and I was just like, "This is insane!" Like, because it's so oh, close no. to what and and obviously shot in Montreal. Uh, it's got a great cast. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, Carolina uh, Bartzak, uh, Mark Gibson, who you know, obviously we've worked with in the past. Uh, he's mm -hmm. he's fantastic. I mean, the performances are there too. They make and and like you were saying, the 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 location of being like a single location and there's more yeah. than one location, but very claustrophobic, very tight, very um, it puts the gears on the audience right to figure out how wow. are these characters actually going to get out if if they are. And it's it's a brilliant film. Is and and the amount of social commentary as well in in the film is is something to is something to take in also. Where where did right. it was that. How much of, of that like, came naturally when you were writing the script and, and you know, yeah. what just kind of came, you know, organically, maybe even when you were filming? Yeah. So I think like you said, like you said, it, it really, the process of the writing of the pro like getting to the final draft, it was definitely uh, organic. You know, I, I wanted, I, I told Derek and Adam, you know, my, my biggest, you know, con not concern, but what I really wanted to explore in the first my first feature i did i wanted to make a, this i wanted to make a horror film that was certain so when we established what was going to be the the conflict and and and, and the environment and the situation with which would, would be the virus in the end i still wanted some character um you know care some great characters to follow i didn't want just to have a situation happen i wanted to have characters to follow that so this is where we kind of put a lot of energy and we wanted to have people that people can relate to um so this is why we put so much time on carolina's character and y yomiko's uh building that 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 connection into related situation with their with their with their abusive uh, husbands and and of course tying into the whole metaphor of the virus itself so the environment came first but then we kind of it came organically building those characters uh which came second uh so it was really important for me and it was important for also the guys you know we wanted to make sure we have a balance of both i i i was really keen on having that that balance and yeah on set uh the the the, the, the i knew that there was going to be um uh, um what's that you know there was going to be a kind of because Carolina, of course, and Yumiko were going to meet for the first time on set. They never worked together. It was going to be the first time. It was going to be very foreign. Uh, so the feeling of them two meeting on set, that's what made it so natural and organic because it was right. like meeting a meeting at a hotel for the first time. And I knew that was – I was hoping that was going to come out of it. Oh, so they, they, had, they had never met before they met on, on in those scenes? She showed up and – hi, nice to meet you. Two hours later, she, they were shooting. So, oh, wow. Um, so, but it made that much more special because I, I was I was kind of betting on that as well because I said to myself, "This is a hotel. There's two women that are crossing paths in a hotel." So it, the characters in real life kind of played in the same played in our yeah. favor. And I, I was hoping that you know, and I even like at one point Yumiko even said to me, she goes, "I want to practice my English. I want to make sure my English is perfect." I go, "No, it's actually perfect that you're English. You have an accent, and then you you don't speak full fluent in English. It's it's actually perfect. It works in our favor because." It goes to sh it, it makes your, your your character that much more believable that you came from out of town and and you're visiting you're staying in this hotel. So when she met with Carolina, that's what made it so so like you said natural and organic when they were working together. I felt the it was it was kind of there were two different universes, but they were so connected in so many ways and uh, you know because of their past and and I I immediately felt the chemistry between them. Uh, well, one of the, if, one if, of the things that yeah. that I yeah, and one of the things I noticed too was that it's so mm. much more than just a pandemic film mm -hmm. and and, mm -hmm. and speaking of those characters yeah um the idea that uh, uh um the idea that that they're both in similar situations yes one 
one is in a sort of like a, a current situation in the current surroundings that, that mm -hmm. she finds herself in. Whereas, you know, the other uh, woman uh, uh, in this film is, is running away. She's halfway across the planet. And yeah. I felt like that's such a, and I know you didn't, and, and, I mean, potentially write it intentionally like this, but watching it in 2020, which when I first saw the film, yes. um, yeah. was like, I remember, you know, I went on a trip and I was coming back I think it was in February 2020. So, yeah, yeah, February 2020. And I remember hearing about COVID and you know stuff coming out of Wuhan and yes. potentially spreading into camp, like whatever. You everyone heard the same thing, and I was just like, "That's so far away." Like, I mean, that'll never, uh, like, maybe yeah. it'll never get to us. I, I mean, you don't want to be naive and think it won't, but yeah, you know, you're. I'm on a plane. I'm. I was just in another country. I'm flying home. It's not yeah. the thing that you think. It's like I'm not going to the other side of the world. And mm -hmm. I thought it was great how it that connects to everything to say you can't really our world is massive it's huge but it's yeah. so small and it's like sort it of like this environment that yeah this hall hallway is is like really um you yeah. know uh, claustrophobic and stuff but the planet can yeah. be like that too like we only have one and yeah like me and you were talking you're in italy i'm in i'm in canada i'm in basically toronto First right time. now uh, and, exactly. and we're talking on the same screen i thought that was a pretty interesting idea and how that kind of connects and and yeah. the actresses I mean, really bring this thing home with the emotional impact that they sort of as as both as mothers, um, one with a daughter and one expecting. Um, yep. Is that how how much of the how much of that was 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 the actresses just like you mentioned that they had first met kind of on set, but um, yeah. how did that develop over the two weeks where you were, you were shooting? You mean uh, when you say develop the, the, their relationship or yeah, or, yeah their their relationship and how they yeah. how they got into their characters and that sort of thing. Yeah, so so definitely, like you know, I, I Yumiko's character <clears throat> initially, like I said, we were making changes to the last draft, and and uh, she wasn't pregnant originally. And I asked her, I go, "Do you have children?" And she told me yes. And when she told me that, and we wanted to raise the stakes of this woman in distress and what, of course, Yumiko goes through in, in the film and the story. I said it would definitely make things interesting if she'd be pregnant. I mean, uh, let's, you know, crawling on the floor with a pregnant belly and the fact that she's been pregnant and she knows what it, what it, what it feels like physically and mm -hmm. mentally being in that character was a big plus for us. And, and that's what I, I, I kind of, and then of course it ties into, to, to Carolina and her family because definitely one of the themes was, and we mentioned, I think we spoke about this in the past where kids, you know, the effects that parents and, and the, you know, uh, parents have on, on our children and our upbringing uh, down the, you know, further down the line. If, and, and that was a theme that was important. So, you know, when we made Yumiko pregnant, it was definitely a good connection to Carolina's uh, family as well, right? And her child. But yeah, they're, they're, they, they immediately, they had a, they had these discussions on set and, and, they were talking about the, the characters and Caroline and I had discussions about the, her, her character every day before we shot scenes together and the motivations behind it. And we trimmed things off. We added things as we went we wanted to make them human. Carolina was very stuck on, you know, she, she made it clear to me and I was all in for that. I said, we got to work together to make sure that the people believe your story, believe that, you know, they can, they can, they can feel your situation. And, and, and the same for, for, for Yumiko. So there was work behind that. Absolutely. And it was all, you know, kind of thought out beforehand and some, of course, on location itself on set, right before we were shooting, we would discuss the scenes and, and what we were doing and what, what were their thoughts about it. And uh, yeah, and they were pretty honest. I told them to be honest with me, what you think. And sometimes we would just cut pages out like that didn't make sense or didn't feel uh, like you said, organic and natural as if, this, these women would be in, a, in a, this, this actual situation. What would they what, what would they experience? So there was a lot of um, yeah. I'm not going to say improvisation, but there was a lot of modifications throughout the process and up to the, the same you know up to the days of shooting and and during this, the days. But it all made the characters that much stronger. So once we got the flow of it and we saw the direction and we knew we had the beginning, we knew where we wanted to end. We were just going with the flow and, and seeing what they were bringing to the table, and they would they would make some 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 suggestions, and I would listen, and we would work together to to make the best choice. So there was definitely an interesting bond happening <clears throat> together, uh, and you felt like I said, you felt it, you felt it when they were performing together, and separately, of course, the, there was definitely um, a presence and a, and 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 a power on on the screen, and and I was like, wow, this is awesome, and uh, like I said, Yumiko. 
she was a warrior. She was a warrior just to, to do, to, I put her through <laughs> what we put her through crawling on that floor, yeah. you know, for about four days. Uh, she had like five, six days of shoot. So yeah, she was uh, three days she spent on the ground and, and she was always on, on, on it, on it. I would tell her, okay, this is the, the, the stages are getting worse. You're getting in a worse situation. You got to give me more of this. And she was on it and she was on it. And, uh, I had a translator on set, so so you would stay with me close by, and I would give him some line, some some information. Like, hey, can you just can you tell her a little bit of this, a little more of that? And she would go. And sometimes I had to hold her. I had to hold her back. I told her, like, listen, you'll be okay. Calm down, please, please, because she was exhausted. <laughs> if she was exhausted, exhausted. She had fever one of the days. On one of the, I think it was one of the last days. Maybe it was the last day. I'm not sure if it was the last day for her, but she got fever. And she had to go to room, take some, you know, luckily she wasn't shooting her scenes then. So she went home, she went up in the room, how she went home. She went in the hotel room upstairs yeah. and uh, she she rested and then she came back and she was ready to go again. So she was, a, honestly, she was a, she was a warrior, warrior. Well, and, one, of the, yeah. one of the cool things about the film too, and I, and I want to, mm -hmm. I'd, be, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mark Gibson's performance as well. Yes, it's a very nuanced performance. Um, uh, of course. So for anyone who's watched the film, uh, Mark Gibson uh, plays the husband. He was an absolute bastard. Uh, but in real life, Mark Gibson is a very nice dude. Uh, it's a testament this guy. to how good of an actor he is because, He's because awesome. he has yeah. this. And I thought one of the interesting things that you guys did too was that a lot of the um, implied violence is, is just that. It's implied. And mm -hmm. I always felt like in horror movies is that the, the less that you show sometimes is the more hor horrifying. It's the more right. terrifying. And I Absolutely. felt like in this movie, it was like, you always kind of saw the aftermath of him apologizing. There wasn't this kind of crazy, you know, uh, uh, you know, let's break everything in the room scene, this big dramatic yes. scene, trying to be, you know, something that like, just trying to make it like, this is a big deal. Like, I mean, people understand, yeah. I think in this environment, how big of a deal uh, domestic uh, abuse is. And mm -hmm. I felt like it was so nuanced where he would kind of come back and float in and out of these scenes where you'd be like, oh my God, like, and your yeah. mind starts filling it in with the worst case yeah. scenarios. Um, was that something also that was kind of determined at the start? Because domestic abuse and the, the theme of that it runs runs throughout this film through through both female leads and their storylines, um, yeah. but also as well through through uh, uh, like we've discussed before, uh, you know, before before getting on on the on the show here, yeah, about how it influences the uh, uh, the daughter and uh, the little girl that's uh, kind of around this both both the virus yeah. and this domestic uh, a toxic relationship. Of course, yes, yes, and uh, like I said, yeah, like you said, Mark Gibson, such a talented actor. It was a, a pleasure working with him. Uh, blessing also it was such a you know, and I, I, that's what caught my eye about Mark is that is like you said, he's such a nice guy, right? And, and, and when you when you see him and you speak to him and in in uh, you know um, <clears throat> you know in real life, and and mm -hmm. I wanted that character to feel as real as possible in the sense where. You can feel in his in his presence, in his performance, that he can be evil and he can be dark and he could have a dark side. Like many people and just that I've encountered in my life that have can have a dark side and yet still have a vulnerability because he's human, right? Someone that's in an abusive relationship, someone that is uh, causing the the, the 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 physical, you know, um, act towards someone, whether it be verbal or or physical, they're human and they have their own issues, right? They have their own psychological issues growing up for whatever reason that brought them to that point and i wanted someone that 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 we can believe that <clears throat> yet he's such an asshole but yet you know at, even at the dark moments for him where he you know i don't want to sp spoil too much but you know we know what happens he gets vulnerable again and then he comes back to his his, his kind of soft side and then back to this violent side and he was doing switches he was going back and forth up to his his his, his death right um where you spoiler, kind of saw spoiler alert spoiler alert <laughs> shit. i know i know i should have i'm hoping by then that people watched it already so yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was important for me and that was one of the things i told mark like well, i i want to see this vulnerable side in you when you when this you know one of your last scenes because it, it goes to show that you know as dark as someone can go, as 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 you know, and this we're talking about in this situation about you know physical abuse and being, you know, as dark as you can go, there's there's a there's a there's a human side to or you know inside you that's that's there that's dormant, right? And that, that I've been a victim. I've I've been a yeah victim of that where I've had moments where I've you, you lose sight of something as of anger and you're just not seen clearly, and then you come back to your senses. 
you know, we're, we're all human. We all make mistakes. We're not perfect. We're all have imperfections. So I, I felt that Mark's character really as a person in life had that element. He could be both like, he's such a nice guy, but yet he could feel so pr dark and, and, and have that presence. Yeah, and I think that's an important thing to note too, because I think yeah. in the conversation around uh, domestic abuse, um, yeah. they're, they're, uh, and not to get too heavy on everyone, but 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 the idea is like you always see in society, you hear the refrains of of well, you know, why didn't that person just leave? Why didn't they just get yeah. out? Uh, if it yeah. was that bad, would you know? Yeah. And, it, and we've come to understand as a society, especially men. I mean, me yeah. and you can fall into that category, obviously. But 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 to say to, to say even if I haven't been in that position myself, yeah. like, a better understanding of like that's it's a full component. It's not always it's not always horrible. And I'm by no means, please do not dis, uh, uh, misinterpret that as saying we're condoning anything. We're not, but, no, but just saying that it is hard for people to get out of that situation. It's extremely hard. Absolutely. It's extremely mentally taxing. And I think that's the thing that I thought came through was like, this is some, some nuances in there where it's like, well, this guy can be a nice guy. That that's, that's yeah. where the manipulation comes from. Uh, exactly. When, when people are in these terrible uh, uh, relationships and, and they're hard to get out, you throw a kid into the mix and it's like, you're not just yeah. kind of worrying about your own mental stability, yeah. but also the mental stability of someone else and the well-being of someone else. And I think that was really cool. driven home in this film. I thought it was pretty well done. So, um, but it's a very, very, very nuanced film. There's definitely a lot of themes going on. So, Hey, listen, if yeah. you haven't checked out Hall, check it out on, uh, uh, you know, Rogers, Bell, Telus, Shaw, uh, MTS, Cross Canada, as well as iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. Um, we're going to get into a couple of questions. We've got a couple of people tuning in. So I said I'd throw up some, uh, uh, we've got the, uh, we've got Mr. Derek Adams up here. He's saying, hey, I have a question. Uh, how will your background in horror influence your films in the future, horror or otherwise? How will your background? Um, you know, uh, that's yeah, an interesting question, Derek. <laughs> uh, Derek wants uh, to know, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why didn't you ask me that today when I spoke to him? Why? <laughs> he put me on the spot. He's gonna be. I'm gonna get him back for this one. Uh, so how? Okay. So how will my background in horror influence films in the future, horror and otherwise? Well, that's you know that's interesting because Derek knows, and uh, you know, I, I, I as a filmmaker. I was definitely like my introduction to film was horror, right? I, growing up as a kid, the films I remember watching as a kid in the eighties was horror films and action films, you know. And yeah. and 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 slowly as I got older, of course, my interest, you know, I went to I, I studied film studies in, in university, and I just watched all types of movies. I love all types of movies. I can't say that there's one genre that is my favorite. And I'm, I'm saying this because I want to get a little backstory because. Derek knows this. I have so many tastes uh, as a filmmaker. There's so many, like example, I'm doing Chitadoro right now, which is a fantastical realism drama. Uh, you know, I cannot tell as a director right now, I cannot say where I want to be in the future of filmmaking in terms of genre. But I could say that horror is a big, is, is definitely, is definitely there. And, and, and some of my other projects upcoming are in the horror genre, whether it be thriller, suspense. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I my my schooling as a as a kid has been horror films, and and there's always been an interest towards it, and I, I think that it's just part of who I am as a filmmaker, and that's maybe why when we look at Hall, there was that dramatic, character driven, um, you know, uh, uh, storyline as well for 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 Carolina's character and, and Yumiko. It's, it's almost like combining my interest in drama as well as horror and this is why when you say you watch it it's not so much of a horror but there's a character driven story behind it yeah. it's, it's almost like two worlds combining and that's just it's not it's happening natural because that's my interest and i wanted to create that because i do have an interest for drama as much as i have for horror so it's 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 tough to say you know what the future holds but i i definitely want to continue doing character driven scripts whether they be complete fully horror horror genre or a mix of both right um but yeah so so definitely i you know with the hall i mean for me it was it was it was like i said it was my first feature and i i, I couldn't think of a better situation for my first feature you know combining those elements and and exploring it and for myself it's as a filmmaker you're always learning you're always learning your craft you're better in your craft and and i think this is why 
this was a perfect moment to, to, to make this film for myself. It's also still finding out who I am as a filmmaker. And I'm, I'm so interested in so many topics. I, you know, I've studied, I studied sociology. So everything about human interaction and, and society interests me, whether it be in a, you know, uh, told in, in, in a genre, uh, genre in terms of a horror genre or into a, in a drama, they're, they're all interest me. So this is something that I'm going to see, I, I think, along the way as I progress in my career, where I want to be. And, and, and uh, yeah, but I'm looking forward to I have so many other projects that Derek and other writers we work with are working together that are in the, uh, you know, in the horror genre. So and for, those, uh, of you, for yeah. those, of, those out there who don't know, who, who is Derek? Can you get yeah. the audience in on who that man is? Mm. Yeah, Derek is uh, Derek is a very talented uh, young writer from Montreal, and he was the writer, one of the writers on Hall. Um, yeah, so Derek came into the project as well. A couple, maybe a year, or maybe a few months, could be a few months after Adam uh, presented the script, and they worked together. Uh, we worked all together, you know, bringing Hall to life. So yeah, definitely, Derek is a great writer and. Uh, uh, I'm great. I'm glad to be uh, working with him on this and future projects as well. So let's yeah. talk about. You mentioned your career, and uh, you know, yeah. as a director, this is obviously your your directorial debut. Uh, you've you've just shot another film as well, uh, and you'll be shooting more, uh, obviously, in the future. Yes. But you started out as an actor, um, and you're, you've been <laughs> on some pretty crazy sets, right? And and I I wanted yeah. to give you the opportunity to tell. Uh, tell us uh, oh, the, these cre yeah. what, what sets have you been on because they're 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 insane. Yeah, yeah. So so I started as uh, so a couple maybe I'd say maybe ten fifteen no almost fifteen years ago. Yeah, fifteen years ago, a friend of mine took me on set and said, "Listen, uh, they're looking for extras, um, non-union extras. You know, paying ten dollars an hour." that's what it was I guess I don't remember what it was but it was like come on set you know you get the experience about what it is to be on a movie set and yeah it'd be fun who cares yeah yeah it'd be lunch. fun and I was yeah exactly free lunch exactly free lunch yeah. you get to see meet people in the industry and I was already working I wasn't working in production I was working in production in my basement with my brother we were you know fooling around with cameras and stuff so we were always making skits and films growing up so there was part of who, who I was I was a film I was a storyteller I was always a storyteller from what I, I can remember, right? So being on set was an interesting, you know, an interesting, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, event for me to, to actually be on a film set when he, my friend proposed this. And I said, okay, let's go. So I want to what the experience was like. And the first film that I think I was on, I believe was uh, Gothica with Halle Berry. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, Gothica, Gothica. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Gothica was Halle Berry and Penelope Cruz. So they, they, they sent us to this prison, which is actually five minutes from my parents house and i guess maybe that's why i went because it was so close to, to, to home and that's what they were looking for people in that area so we went and i played an orderly uh in the scene and i got to see penelope cruz and and, and halle berry i even spoke to her on set briefly i opened the door for her so i was like overwhelmed and, and to be on this hollywood <laughs> set and all the and all the cameras and i was like wow this is awesome this is this is great i like this i really like this experience and then they call us for another film a couple of months later which was uh wicker park uh with josh yep. hartman uh, yep. yeah 2005 or something so that was another project though and so, so slowly but surely i became part of the the casting associate the the, the 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 you know the extras casting that we have here in montreal and they were throwing me everywhere because I was just available and I wanted to be on set. I wanted to experience it. I wanted to experience it. It was just, a, it was so, so, um, yeah, it was over. It wasn't even overwhelming. It was just, it, it, I felt, I felt the connection right away. I felt this is something, you know, and where I really knew, where I really knew this is what I wanted to do. And not even was acting. It was more to be, a, it was just storytelling and be a director. Where I really, where I really clicked was when I got a, this extra gig. I was on set as an extra for a film from Chaz Palmetieri. He was an actor director uh, who did Bronx Tale and uh, analyzed this, and of course some other classics in the eighties, seventies. Uh, He's been around, and he was directing a film in Montreal. And um, so I went on as an extra, and they. <laughs> They uh, they wrapped up. Every, they wrapped everyone. It was a big scene with extras. They wrapped everyone, and they kept me, me and two other people behind. They said, "Listen, the director wants to keep you for for the scene that they're doing, a family scene." And I had no idea what what was going to happen. I just I was there as an extra, you know, eating. And so they they bring me into this this lo this this apartment downtown Montreal on Sherbrooke Street, and this is two thousand five, let's say. So this is where kind of I did the the the, the real you know this is the realization moment. 
of this is I want, this is what I wanted to do, and I and I never looked back ever since. Um, so I go on set, and uh, the director says, "I see Chaz, and he's, he's really tall, and I've seen him in Bronx Tale, and I like you, you know, I look you look up to him. It's like cool, man. I'm working with Chaz Palminteri, and he goes, okay, so Frank, uh, listen, I'm gonna. He actually, I even called me by my name. He 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 just called me. He just was talking direct directing towards me and looking at me and saying, okay, this is what you're gonna do, and uh, you're gonna walk in, and I want you to, you know." Push the not push the actress, but kind of not allow her to leave the house. So when she comes in, you need to kind of feel like you're you're imposing on her and her space. So she needs to move out of the way while you walk in, and then you're gonna come and have supper with your family. And I ended so what the scene ended up being is that Susan Sarandon is supposed to walk out of the house, but because I come into the room, she can't get out. So I had to kind of push her out of the way and say, you know, sorry, but uh, we're here. And I was coming in with my wife, which was the other extra. So. So I got I got thrown some lines on set, and the scene was with <laughs> with Susan Sarandon. So I'm talking with Susan Sarandon, like the director <laughs> talking to me and Susan Sarandon. I, I imagine I just this is my third set, and I'm here like, I, and you know what? It I wasn't even I was nervous, but I wasn't nervous. I felt at home. I felt that this was awesome, and and and. And then the next thing you know, they bring me in another room, and I'm a, I'm having supper with Penelope Cruz. I'm a I'm a I'm a relative of Penelope Cruz because it was a Spanish family, and I was Italian. We had Spanish, you know, uh, you know, attributes, physical attributes. So it was all very Spanish, and uh, so so she was sneaking in, and 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 uh, yeah. So my scene was with her and Penelope Cruz, my first <laughs> acting gig, my first line, and I got an upgrade, and I became an actor member. At that moment, I got an upgrade a couple. of, weeks later and then i oh then yeah you're in a movie of susan sarandon so that was it that was that was the turning point for me and i said to myself i remember calling a friend of mine and i said man i you don't know what happened to me today and even just like wow this is awesome and i said this is what i want to do this is what i want to do i, I want to be on film sets you know and i wasn't at that moment i wasn't saying yeah i want to be an actor it was it was yes it, i definitely wanted to explore this this acting career but i knew deep down it was always the storytelling that was gonna come right. come forth, and I knew that later on because I spoke to my agent about it as well. We had talks about it over the years, which we'll, we could be here forever just talking about all yeah, the yeah. situation. But I did say to my agent, she used to tell me, she goes, Francesco, do you want to be an actor or do you want to be? A, she had an English accent. She was she was awesome. Uh, uh, do you want to be an actor or do you want to direct? You got to make that decision because you got to take it serious. So. With the years of acting, which I took about five years of auditioning and, and taking classes, and I'll tell you some of those quick, quickly, those other sets that I was on, uh, finally I decided in 2010 that directing is what I wanted to do the most. But that experience mm -hmm. as an actor on those sets for a huge training and, and, and uh, experience for what I am what, for, for today, working with actors. And I think Mark Gibson even said that to me once on set. He goes, Frank, you're, you're, a, you're an actor's director. You know, you know what it's like to be in front of the camera. So it definitely helped tremendously for my acting, for my directing uh, skills, right? So um, yeah, so after that, following that, that experience, I got on, on, on I, I worked on 300 with Zack Snyder. I spent five months with Zack Snyder after, yeah, he just came, okay, he finished uh, Donna, Dawn of the Dead, right? I think it was a, a year before. I think it was Dawn yeah. of the Dead mm -hmm. a year before. Yeah. So he was, you know, uh, Frank Miller's 300 was his breakthrough. And I was there to see it come to life, man. I was on set watching him prepare all those, those beautiful imagery. Like with Frank, he was on set as well, just getting all the comic strips ready. And you knew something special was happening when I was on that set. You knew it, the technology and, and what they were doing because I never seen anything like that. And people were talking on set that this was going to be innovative and epic uh, in terms of visual composition of how he was bringing this script, this, this comic book to life. And I mm -hmm. felt it. I felt it the moment I was there. I saw it. I saw it. And I spent five months on set. So I was there every day. Right. So I got to really get per close to everyone and, and, and Zach and watch him work. And I was, a, I was a double, I got a double job, a stand in job for one of the, the main actors. Um, so, and not to, just, just to jump in here as, as yeah. well, Francisco, is that is that you know we we worked at the deal for Hall Black Fold Distribution brought you into the Black Fold Distribution family. Uh, yes. you worked with Zack Snyder on, on three hundred for five months, and then a couple months after yeah. you know we signed the deal with Hall, Zack Snyder's yeah. Justice League cut comes out. I don't know coincidence. I, I know. I'll, yeah. I'll leave up that. I'll leave that up to uh, speculation for our audience for sure. But uh, we were talking about hey. that. We were talking about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's it. So, so, yeah, it was a great experience. That was definitely a great experience and an education. That was my schooling. Honestly, being on set, 
I, at that point, I, I, I just noticed myself going on set for that reason. I was just curious to see how everything was, you know, just the behind the scenes, the operation behind the machine and, and the direction, the, the technical side, the lighting. I learned all about filmmaking on set, mostly as an extra, or like whatever I was doing after that, small roles here and there and, and, and commercials. Uh, like we mentioned in the past, I worked on X-Men and I started working with the... Uh, yeah, I worked with Brian Singer. I worked with a few other big directors. I worked over at least 50 pictures in the last uh, 15 years, definitely over 50 pictures, whether it be as a silent on camera, a small role, uh, an extra. Um, but I always did it for the right reason. It was always, and even until this day, even while I'm directing, sometimes they call me still to say, hey, you want to come and audition or you want to come and do a small role? And I say, yes, I go. And even if I'm an extra. I don't care. I mean, I enjoy just the experience of being around the people and 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 people on set. We're all you know, we're all fil we're all artists. We we want to. We're all there for different reasons, but you become a family and you get to, to experience that. And it's a beautiful thing when you watch everybody working together and 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 making so, something. You know. So, yeah. Yeah. So we're gonna go way over our time lot. Our time allotted. Yeah, that's so fine. That's I fine. know it's late there. What time is it right there right now? Just so because everyone thinks it's, that you're in Montreal and you're on the same yeah. time zone as us, but you're not. You're six <laughs> hours ahead. So it's like two two a.m. right now. Yeah, uh, I, I do have to ask you this because this is a fascinating story, and maybe we can just do a Cole's Notes version of it. But um, yeah. we got to talking, and we kind of got on the phone a couple of times, and we just you know we were talking mm -hmm. about Hall and doing the deal and whatever and the release schedule for everything, mm -hmm. and we got to chatting. But you have a fascinating story about when you were on the set of X-Men, uh, it was Days of Future Past, right? And yes. I'm wondering if you can break that down because I think it was it was such a cool, like yeah. fly on the wall story that I was like, like, like I'm not yeah. gonna ruin it, it's your story, but like, but uh, yeah. uh, can you can you just kind of give us the Cole's notes on that? Because it, it's, it's hilariously yeah. funny, but in a really inspiring way. Yeah, yeah, so you know, we talk about moments in your career <clears throat> and uh, when I was mentioning that film with Chas Palmetier was a moment where I knew I wanted to work in the film business. I could say that Days of Future Past, this moment was a moment where I knew that I wanted to direct the rest of my life. You know, this was a moment, and and it was just because, yeah, like uh, like like you said, I'll, I'll explain a bit about the backstory to it. So I, I got a I got a role, I got a small role as a secret agent of President Nixon, <clears throat> and I'm, whoever watched the film knows the scene where you know President Nixon is taken into the the vault at the end. Uh, to protect to protect him from the the villains, and uh, so I'm one of his you know secret agents protecting him. So I got to spend maybe four months on that set. Uh, yeah, three or four months. It was a whole summer. So I got called to do that role, and uh, yeah, so I was in this huge setting in Montreal. They they created this whole set outside, and we were. It was hot. It was hot. It wasn't easy. It was raining some days. It was a tough shoot. It wasn't easy. We were in suits, and it was mid midsummer. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so what happened is, um, <clears throat> we got really close the, the bunker boys, they called us the bunker boys. And I, we actually got a t-shirt at the end. We all got a t-shirt called the bunker boys. So all the, <laughs> the actors, <laughs> um, oh, I love that shit. Awesome. Yeah. We became, we became really close family with the, the, the and then Peter Dinklage was amongst that crew as well, because he was in the, the vault with us. So. You know, people know the X-Men, that there's Jennifer Lawrence, there's Ma uh, James McAvoy, there's Michael Fassbender, there's uh, Hugh Jackman, there's, they're all there, right? So this mm -hmm. was like, <clears throat> this is pretty good. It was actually a pretty good film. I, I enjoyed the, the Days of Future Past one. Yeah, the, the, front, the X -Men yeah. franchise. Yeah. So <clears throat> one day I was on set and um, we, had a, 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 we had a situation where Jennifer Lawrence had to decide if she was going to kill Peter Dinklage or not. And I think in the final product, I don't think she does kill him. But um, while they were doing that scene, we were all there, right? And uh, she was in her mystique outfit, and she had to decide if she was going to shoot him. And so she started questioning, basically, with Brian Singer, if she should kill him or not, and that she wasn't sure about it, based on her character's motivation, her backstory, and what she actually do that. And so there was a whole discussion, and and and, and Brian came out, and and then the writers, and they were just like trying to figure out what's what's the story here, what are we doing, like what are we killing him or not, and and you. You got to see a bit of the the, the the behind the scenes of what what takes place with with like any film set, right? The conf the, the confusion or just the misunderstanding or trying to figure things out because that's what filmmaking is all about: problem solving and staying true to the story. So, mm -hmm. so they stopped. They had a meet. They 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 had a break. They said, "Okay, everybody's going to break. Uh, you guys take time off. Uh, go to the the craft table." And 
So I'm just with my hands in my pocket in my CIA 1970 suit walking around the set, the bunker, you know, and <laughs> not, I'm slowly leaving the set, but everybody's already gone. Yeah. <clears throat> and the actors, they grab a chair and they get into the circle, which was really cool, man. It was like a nice community little, you saw the bond between the actors and everybody knew each other and they got, got into this little circle. And these are the main uh, players, right? These are the main, these are the main these players. Are the main, so yes, yeah. so we got James, the, yeah, James McAvoy was there. They're, they're all there. Jennifer Lawrence, uh, Hugh Jackman. Uh, maybe Hugh Jackman wasn't there for that scene. Maybe he was, uh, he was coming up later. So he wasn't there. Uh, Michael Fassbender's Magneto was there. The writers were there. The producers were there. Um, uh, Brian Singer was there and they just got into the circle on set <laughs> right in front of the bunker <clears throat> and started talking about the situation, the scene that they needed to figure out if if Mystique, of course, based on her character, would she kill Peter Dinklage or not, uh, Peter K Dinklage's character, and how would that inf influence or affect the, the, the films to come, right? Because if they're doing a spinoff on Mystique, th this had to be all calculated. So they probably missed something somewhere and and they needed to question it and make sure that they don't fuck up so they, they yeah. actually they actually thought about it. they had to think twice and this is why they had this meeting it was really important i got to figure that out by listening and slowly but surely like i had mentioned i grabbed a chair a folding chair and i slowly slowly found a way to get myself outside the circle that they were talking the funniest thing this is the funniest thing i've ever heard it's just like i'm just gonna slide in here <laughs> And you're in a suit, so it's very nondescript, right? It's not like you're in a bright yellow, you know, it's not like you're in a superhero costume, right? You're just a guy in a suit. You look like a security anyway. I looked like security. <laughs> but no one said a word. That's what was amazing. I, no one said a word. And you saw that. I, I'm not supposed to be there. But no one said a word because they were so into the conversation that they were having. They were so into the figuring this out that they were like, okay, don't like they didn't, they didn't bother. They didn't care. And, and that was awesome because... I sat down there and I listened for about almost two hours. I think it was about a two-hour conversation they had. And what I think when I said about the transitional moment for me is that I realized that even at a Hollywood level, uh, $300 million production, people still have issues. People still make mistakes. People are still trying to figure things out. It's nothing different than when we're making an indie horror film of 300000 versus $300 million. It's the same process. And that's what I, I learned from that moment is that Wow, I mean, Brian Singer, he's he's getting he's he's getting shat on from the writers telling them, you know, that he should do this this way. Like he, he you see that it, that that the power behind the machine and 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 that we all it, it's it's human. Like it's even at that scale, it's and I, I at that moment I felt that man, I could do this. I could direct films. I could direct films and 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 you know, it's the same it's a smaller scale what we're doing, but it's the same operation and the same questions and the same uh, conflicts that they, they encounter the, the filmmakers. And uh, so that was really revel like, it was definitely a moment for me that I said, wow, I, I had the confidence and, and, and uh, to pursue, to continue to, to really push as a director after that film was, was f full gear. And that's what I did. I ended up starting to direct a lot more, started getting shorts ready. And that like two years later, I started getting the feature scripts into to development, I said, I'm going full throttle with this. I want to do this. I love this. I love filmmaking. And when I that that's that was one of the transitional moments for me. And yeah, so I, it was really, it was really special. And 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 quick, quick, I didn't tell you this part, but I want to tell you quickly because there was another moment that <laughs> this was a funny moment. It was like four in the morning, so we all got costume and we were all getting ready. And I was having coffee with one of my friends who was an actor as well, and we're having co coffee within the. The, the trailers and it's 4 a.m. There's the mist is still up. The sun is not even up yet, yeah. and everybody's <laughs> in preparation. And we're walking in the in the, in, the, in the trailers, and we hear this ding noise, like a ding ding, and it sounds like bells or like dumbbells. And we were not sure, so we're just following the sound of the dumbbells. So we're just going walking along the the, the trailers. We turn a corner. <laughs> we turn a corner, and there you see is Hugh Jackman doing deadlifts at four in, the, <laughs> four, <laughs> four in the morning he's doing deadlifts and you had to see we, we we turned the corner we were face to face with him and we were dressed in our cia agent suits and he was just there with his tight uh, i don't know what he was wearing but he was he was ripped and he was just pumping up for his day just to show you the dedication this guy has He's unbelievable. Such a such a great actor and great. Uh, he's so disciplined, and 
he was always on the ball on set. And he was so kind and nice. And that that was so funny. That was a funny moment. But I have to yeah. say, I have to say, because we just followed the sound of the bells and it was him just doing deadlifts. And it was insane. When we turned that corner, it was scary. It was scary. You had the mist in the background and the sun was rising. It was a, it was a scene within itself. <laughs> <laughs> it should have been in the. It should have been in the film. That's so, amazing. Um, amazing. Well, take note. Take note, Marvel. Listen, if you need a guy, there's a guy I know. He's been on. He's been on set. He knows all the main players. He's seen Hugh Jackman deadlift weights at four in the four in the morning. Uh, morning. Uh, so, yeah. if you need someone to helm the new uh, Marvel X Men movie, uh, I got a guy yeah. I can recommend for sure. So uh, that's yeah. amazing. And it, it's just. Uh, um, I, I wanted you to tell that story because it's so it's so yeah. funny and so um, and it's not yeah. necessarily. Um, uh, that, that it's it's cool that it's an X Men movie and there's all these players there and, yeah. and that, that's awesome. Uh, but also just like how how much you can learn uh, learn the craft just by listening to others or or seeing them do it. Um, we're all we're like we're all sponges, right? And we soak up kind of whatever's around us. And if it's good stuff, then 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 ultimately you can use that um, uh, to your benefit later on, right? So, yeah. um, but uh, listen, we've gone way over time, but I do still have a rapid fire section I got to get to. So um, yeah, let's I do it. Remiss. If uh, remiss if I didn't if I didn't put you through the same brutally hard questions that I put all my other oh guests my from. Okay, oh so um, it's it's but, now it's not it's not terribly it's not it's not that bad. But, but this is this is even this is even more difficult because it's a different time. Um, it's two a.m. for me, so it's, it's that's right. It's so that means that anyone that's, that's tuning in, we're gonna get the good shit. We're gonna get the real answers, the honest answers right now okay. because Francisco okay. is a little bit sleepy. So yeah, uh, so if but, I, uh, can I pass it? Can I pass if I don't <laughs> if I don't have an answer? <laughs> sure. Well, we'll see. We'll see when we get there, right? But uh, okay. just let everyone know um, uh, this section of the of the of, of Takeover Tuesday is brought to you by us, our sponsor which is Wellington Brewery, uh, Wellington Lager, Hell's Lager, Hell's Yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to crack this open. i got to wet my whistle here a little bit. But uh, uh, Hell's Lager and Wellington Brewery is located in Guelph. They're our sponsor. They keep Black Lawn Distro going throughout the year when we're on our convention circuit, as well as when we are stuck at home in uh, stay-at-home orders or lockdown or whatever you want to call it. Um, but uh, we just wanted to say cheers and thanks for sponsoring us. Cheers. Uh, cheers. For, uh, this, um uh, this uh, this pandemic, uh, we do appreciate it. And if you're in the Glo Guelph Waterloo area, uh, swing by their brewery located on um, on, on uh, Woodlawn Road, and you can pick up a case of Hell's Lager. Uh, anyway, okay, so let's move on. So it's just basically the first the first uh, uh, answer that pops <coughs> into your head. Okay, um, there now I I should preface this first question. Okay, uh, because I wrote it. Uh, and I put it into the into the programming uh, a little bit earlier this afternoon, and then it also started snowing in Canada. So it's snowing oh right God. now where I am in Canada. So it's it's. I think this is going to be it's going to be a way easier question than I originally thought. But rapid fire, okay. yes or no? Uh, Italy is better than Canada. Yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> moving on. That's all we need to say. No, it <laughs> depends on what we're talking about. We're are we talking about food? Are we talking about temperature? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think Italy's <laughs> No, we're moving on. It's okay, so uh, listen, you got to pick one rapid fire. Uh, Carolina Bartzak or Michael Fassbender, who is more fun to have on set? Oh, I, I'm going to say Carolina because I've worked directly with her. So I'll say Carolina, definitely. But Mike, Michael, is, he's a character. He's a character. So, so, so I, I tried to listen. And for those of you tuning in, I've tried to, I've tried to pull out some fast bender stories from Francisco, but he says maybe one day, but we don't yeah. know each other well enough yet. But he's like, yeah, he's got but, some dandies apparently. But Carolina must have more stories about, about Michael because they worked hand in hand. Right. So uh, yep. I've worked with both of them and, and, uh, but I, I was much closer to Carolina. We had a good time and I can't, I can't compare, you know, I, I didn't spend as much time with Michael, but so I'll say Carolina. And, uh, and uh, for, for, yeah, for those, uh, uh, those of you who don't know, uh, um, so Carolina played, uh, uh, Michael Fassbender's wife in um, X Men Apocalypse. Apocalypse, um, exactly. So, so the next movie after, uh, and you weren't in that one. You were just in Days of Future Past, right? So exactly. But I met Michael on Three Hundred, where Michael Fassbender right. wasn't even. He was still up and coming. He was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and then he was in everything and exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay, so moving on, rapid fire. Uh, listen, help us out. Uh, looking back on everything you've done up until now, what's a project that you wish you could have contributed to but couldn't at the time? Uh, when we talk about uh, what's a project, project that I've done, you mean, or that I would have liked? project that you thought, like, hey, I, I would love to have been involved in that. I maybe had the opportunity to be involved in that, uh, but for whatever reason, I couldn't be or I didn't or. Hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, whew, I'm trying to think. Let me think. There was one project that actually was being filmed in Montreal in Italy as a co-production, and uh, I got a call. 
to be an assistant director on that set. And I, I wanted to experience it and I, to be an assistant director on a third AD. It was a third AD job. And it was called uh, Barney's version. I don't know if you remember that one. Yeah. 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 You remember Barney's version? Yeah. So that was with, um, what's his name? Um, okay. It's not coming to me. Uh, Paul tired. Giamatti, isn't it? Paul Giamatti. Yeah. Exactly. Paul Giamatti. So they called me because they knew I was Italian and they were doing scenes in Italy. And it just so happened when they called me, I was already in Italy. So, the, you know, and because and, and, uh, I was on vacation with my family. It was a summer. And uh, they called me and they said, listen, and, and back then there was no cell phones because this was in 2000. And, oh, there was cell phones, but it was, I didn't have one when I was in Italy. I was using the, the house phone still. <laughs> and um, they called me and then they said, listen, we got to get a hold of you because we got to we got to, we want to get you this job as a third AD because you speak Italian. So it's perfect for you. You know, you'll be, you'll be very efficient on set. And so they had to call my, my, my grandparents house in Italy to get a hold of me because I didn't have a cell phone. I was in Europe. <laughs> so it was so complicated. And in the end, I didn't get the job because they went with somebody that was much more available and easier to get a hold of. Yeah. It, it, had a, it had a cell phone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, because people, they were calling people from Montreal, right? They thought I was in Montreal and they were going to ship me to Italy. But I said I was already in Italy. So they said, okay, that could be, that could be much easier. We'll just ship you from Italy to the, whatever town you're in to the next town where they're shooting. And in the end, it didn't work out. So I, I, I kind of, that stayed with me because I really wanted to experience that third AD job. I never got a chance to do it after that. And, um, uh, so yeah, so that's probably one project that about okay. that maybe I wanted that's to work great on. Answer. Yeah. That's a great answer. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so moving right on, right along rapid fire. What do you want? Uh, you can collaborate with any other artist, dead or alive. Who would you pick and what would you want to work on? Hmm. Okay. Uh, Okay, so I have to say it because I've been work. I've been thinking about him for a while and for this project. So I, I am developing a project for a lot. I've been working on it for the last ten years, and um, it's a it's a I'd say a dark dark drama comedy, very Cohen brother esque in terms of style. And uh, I've been working on this for ten years, and it was inspired by true. I'd say tr my 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 life in the past in terms of uh, my a job that I did. Back in the day, I was a mailman. I never told you this, but I, I don't know if I did. I used to be a mailman once upon a time. I had some stories, man. So I used to be a mailman, and I got inspired to, to, to develop a screenplay based on a certain uh, uh, place within the post office that they had. They called the dead letter office, where lost mail goes to. And I'm I'm cutting off. I'm back. Yeah, yeah, you're cutting off just a little bit there. I think I think we're okay, but yeah. Yeah. Go so ahead. basically, what happened? I'm, I'm, do I have time to explain this a bit, or do I yeah, I think so. it's up to you, man. You're the one. You're the one that's operating uh, outside, outside, outside of your bedtime hours. I'm gonna sleep tomorrow morning. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm definitely gonna sleep <laughs> tomorrow morning. This is the last but, uh, thing. This is the last thing on your agenda, man. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So uh, what happened? So yeah. So so basically, my experience at the post office. I spent almost eight years as a mailman. And let me tell you, as a mailman, you got a lot of – your mind is going. You're thinking, you're thinking, you're thinking. So I started working on this project in 2011. And uh, I, I, I'm presently about to finish another draft of it with a writer of mine, a friend of mine, works with me. And he's, he's going to deliver the draft in the upcoming weeks. And I'm really excited about this script and this story because it's personal, but it's also – it's it's really evolved over the years, and it's it's so much fun. And we really developed the main character as a strong, strong presence and a, a huge uh, change and evolution. Like whoever, whichever character actor wants to, that's going to take on this role, is definitely going to be uh, one to remember uh, because of the way the the character arc and the way we've developed him from from working. The, it's almost like a Breaking Bad Walter White type of character. And that being said. Brian Cranston is probably the guy I'm I'm dying to work with, and I met him. I met him two years ago. I went to watch him. I went to watch a show uh, in New York. Fast, fast! I'll tell you that story because it's answering the question. Brian Cranston, I want to work with for this film because he's been in my mind since I wrote this, and because of course of what I did with Breaking Bad and Walter White's character. And I met him at this after the show. He did a. Um, he did a play of one of my favorite films. They adapted into a, a Broadway show, which is called a film called Network, 1976. Yeah, mm -hmm. one of my that's probably one of my top favorite films of all time. This is where I was talking about before. You know, when I talk about the horror genre, there's a there's a world that I love different films, and and this was one of my 
films that inspired me also when I was in school. I watched them in school for the first time. It was 1976. And they made it into a play. And Brian Cranston was the main star playing, you know, uh, Howard Beale. So I go, this is perfect. I go, this is insane. My favorite film, my favorite actor. I got to go see it. So I went to watch it. I finished the show. There was uh, 20 people in line waiting around, hoping the actors were going to come out and did some autographs and stuff. So they ended up coming out. And, and then finally, Brian came out last. And I got to the bottom, back of the line. I wanted to be the last one. And at this point, I have to be honest, I already had contacted his agent. But because I wanted to bring up the script to her about what I was working on. And the agent said, listen, you got to come back when you got an offer. You know, the way it works. It's yeah. And these are A-list actors. It's a whole different world. And it's, Jesus, it, it was. So I said, Walter I White, for Christ's sake. Right? Walter yeah. White. Yeah, yeah. So he's he's a star now. And I backed off and I said, okay. And, and But I do crazy things like that sometimes where I just call the agents myself and <laughs> start pitching projects. But it wasn't a bad, it was, it was a great conversation I had. It was just. You got to come back with the, the with the the offer, right? So, but I left it. I let it. I let it be. And this is a years late, like a year later. I met. The, I, I I get in line. I get to Brian. I say it's an. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said it's an honor to meet you. Uh, uh, it's just an honor to see you perform and 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 work. You know, uh, this 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 is one of the films that inspired me to be a filmmaker and to see you perform as the main character. It's it's really great. It's you know, thank you. And he goes up, thank you. Such a nice guy. Thank you so much. I appreciate it that you guys are coming. You guys, my was my brother. Thank you for coming. So he takes a picture with us, and of course he's tired. He's exhausted. So I don't want to bother him. And I'm not going to be one of those guys that you know I'm pitching you a project. All yeah, I said was, "Here's a script." <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's what you know. Those horror horror stories. But that, I just turned around. I said, "Listen, Brian. I go. I have to tell you. I've been working on a script for ten years, and I've had you in mind. And I've already spoken to your agent about it. But I'm not going to talk about it right now. I'm just going to tell you that I'm looking forward to one day working with you on this project. I swear to you, that's what I said. <laughs> but my brother was a witness. He was right next to me, and I and he goes to me. Well, he goes. You know what? The universe brought us together today." The world is small because I know you who you are, and I hope I'm looking forward to seeing you in the future. Very short, brief. It was along those lines. I don't remember exactly, but yeah, that yeah. was kind of the idea. We shook hands, and that was it. And I walked off. So I kind of was, you know, uh, as my, my brother said, it, like kind of preparing my my not my future, but you know, trying to project of what I want and 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 the positive energy building that with Brian it, going to that show was the first step, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so Brian Cranston definitely to answered the question. We went off on another, on another story, but <laughs> Brian, Brian Cranston, no, and one, awesome. uh, one of my, my my films that's based on the ma my mailman experiences when I was working as a mailman at the yeah. post office. And 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 just just a just a side caveat to that, uh, um, you know, they used to call uh, uh, Carl Malone for the Utah Jazz, a famous basketball player. The Utah Jazz yeah. they used to call him the mailman because he always delivers. Right? Delivers. So, <laughs> so uh, and also speaking of Brian Cranston, if anyone hasn't seen, uh, if you haven't seen uh, the show uh, Your Honor, uh, it was on. Oh, uh, my Gochon, God. I believe uh, it's a yeah. fantastic series, kind of like sort of like Breaking Bad meets Ozark, kind of like. Um, yeah. A little yeah. bit in that same sort of vicinity, but it, it's an excellent show, and he's a he's a he's a, an amazing actor too. So uh, yeah, so yeah, that answer checks out. Um, yeah. so, uh, so so okay, so just got a couple left, real quick. Uh, but yeah. uh, like, listen, tell us a little bit more. What's a great indie film? Um, you know, other obviously other than Hall, but uh, the, yeah. what's a great indie film that you've seen recently? I know you've been oh, busy, but over yeah, the last yeah. Few months, maybe. That gonna be, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I guess it's been a while. I haven't been watching movies, uh, indie films in the last while. Uh, I, you know what? I've seen a few good ones. The last ones I've seen, the indie films were at the um, the the Blood and Snow. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was uh, the one with, um, oh my God, it's slipping now, with, with uh, Julian, something for Jackson, I think it was. Oh, uh, anything for Jackson. Yeah. Anything for Jackson. Yeah. Yes, that one that was. Uh, Vicious Fun. Uh, there was a few great ones. I was I was watching those films with my parents at home because we were waiting for Hall to premiere, and we had the whole yeah, super for, channel. Uh, uh, for the sake of Vicious, actually, yeah, yeah. For the sake of Vicious. Sorry, my God, I'm terrible yeah. with names, and I'm tired right now. But but that was the last time I watched some indie flicks because after, after that I left Italy a month later, and uh, I haven't really you know watched any. But there was a few good ones there, I have to say, and some of them I think you guys are on board as well. And 
wow, it's like this is awesome to see what indie filmmakers are making and and the quality. It's uh, yeah. There's, there's uh, a hotbed of there's a hotbed of talent in uh, in in sort of like the southern Ontario and Quebec yes. areas. Like there's there's definitely lots of people moving and shaking right now, making a lot of that's great what I, That's what I that's what I told myself when I saw those films at the festivals. Derek and I were all Adam. We were all watching and uh, we were like impressed, you know and and. I was like, man, there's some great talent uh, out there, you know? And um, yeah, so I can't really, t I'm sorry, I, I can't be more specific, but that was the last mo time I watched some indie flicks and it was that festival. And I remember saying, wow, these, these films are great. The performances were great. The scripts were, were great. Uh, very impressed, very impressed with uh, what's out there for, from Canadian talent. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to be amongst, the, amongst those. And that's why I was so happy when I won the Best Director. I was, wow, it was, it was humbling. I was like amongst all these, these, these great directors, it was, um, it was something special for me. I have to say, you know, I never, ex I didn't expect anything. I just, <clears throat> it was, a, it was, I was just happy to be part of the festival, and um, yeah, um, it was awesome. It's a great, it's a, yeah, it's a great festival. We know uh, it we is. Definitely know the, is. Uh, um, the festival uh, uh, um, programmers. Yeah. Uh, very good friends of them for a number of years. They do fantastic work over in Toronto, and uh, they are amazing. Job. Uh, amazing. The one thing that people don't know about Blood in the Snow, or you know, if you've been yeah. a couple of times, you do know. But for those of you out there who who don't know, is that it's 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 basically a hundred percent Canadian films that yep. are programmed uh, in the festival. It, it's sort of a bit of a one of a kind um, because because uh, I don't think they have international. I don't know if that's changed recently, but like but typically the whole entire program is Canadian films, yeah. Canadian features, Canadian shorts, up and coming yeah. directors, established directors, and it's a good mishmash yeah. of, of who's who in the in the Canadian film scene. So if you haven't got a chance to go, it's a fun, it's a blast if you go in person. Obviously, it was a virtual festival last year, but. Yeah. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And I should I should I should mention that uh, yeah for the sake of vicious which which was uh, directed by uh, um, Reese and uh, 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 Gabe uh, was uh, yep. yeah came out today actually came out today on uh, on VOD so uh, check that out everyone if you can awesome. uh, it, it's a fantastically bloody film as well as the yeah. title would suggest yeah, and, yeah. Uh, one last question for you and then we're gonna wrap yeah. things up because I know it's super late this is the longest takeover Tuesday we've ever done but oh really hey, <laughs> listen before y'all get too excited uh, hey we miss you over here in Canada when are you coming back. <laughs> that's a that's an interesting question actually it's the hardest one of them all i don't you know i it's tough to say uh, honestly no I, I should be back very soon uh i would say in the next next month or so i should be back because we're actually releasing another feature right now on may 15th right where we're releasing another film and uh it's, it's, it's completed so i have to come back for work uh to, to take care of business but <clears throat> and of course you know i'm working on other projects as well but I said to myself, I was going to wait as long as possible because of the whole situation happening with the, with the uh, you know uh, the COVID. You have to come back and you got to stay in a hotel for three days, and if you're positive, you got to quarantine. Like it seems very com complicated. So I said to myself, I just finished the film. I'm going to rest a bit. I uh, I'm working remotely from here at this point. The editor is starting to work on the film remotely, so I can do some meetings on Zoom. There was no urgency. The only urgency was to take care of some business uh for for woodland and of course for hall as well mm -hmm. but um i was looking to come back no matter what even before any of this i was always looking to come back for may the first you know mid-may no later than june so i should be back in canada within uh, the next month let's say give or take yeah well when yeah. When, when all the snow has gone right so <laughs> yeah, when all the snow's gone, I, yeah, it warms yeah. up. I'll stay over here in Italy and just eat grapes and drink wine the whole time, and like you guys can, <laughs> you guys can shiver over there in uh, in Ontario, <laughs> Quebec. <laughs> I like that eat grapes. That's such a actually they don't eat, they don't they don't eat much grapes here. <laughs> <laughs> all I'm it's saying good. is the food. Yeah, I mean it's better. Yeah, food I know what you're saying. Food. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, I get it. I get it. Listen, that, that's all I got for the rapid fire. Uh, just to let everyone know, again, yeah. brought to you by our sponsor, which is uh, uh, Wellington Brewery, uh, Hell's Lager, Hell's Yeah, uh, delicious beer you can pick up uh, at the LCBO in Ontario as well as their local brewery on uh, Woodlawn Road. Um, but uh, yeah, listen, just a bit of fun. Uh, thanks so uh, thanks yeah. so much for, for doing that, Francesco. I know, look, I know you're, you're looking a bit you're looking a bit tired, so I think we should, we should wrap things up. But we've been going over, <laughs> we, we're almost cruising up. We've been going over uh, an hour and 18 minutes, which is, it, yeah. which is a record. This is the longest Takeover Tuesday we've ever done um, and the wow. furthest Takeover Tuesday we've ever done. So we're the furthest distance away. Uh, it's also yeah. the Takeover Tuesday. It sets a record for having the guests stay up the latest as well. So <laughs> you're, you're, you're just reaping in the reward. You're just reaping the rewards. Thank in. you. And um, uh, 
Hey, listen, um, thank you so much for, for being a part of the, uh, of the program. Uh, we do really appreciate you taking over our, our, our Instagram today, posting all kinds of cool behind the scenes. Anyone wow. watching, if you haven't checked it out, check out our Instagram, uh, which is uh, at Black Pond Distro. And uh, mm -hmm. you, can obviously, um, you can obviously follow uh, uh, Francisco uh, on Instagram as well, both at uh, Francisco Gianni uh, Director, as well as at Hall the Movie. Uh, and also check out Frankie Films. That's uh, that's your production company. Uh, you've got a YouTube yep. channel. So um, hey, listen. You know what? Smash that. Or is it? Smash that subscribe button if you yep. uh, hit up on YouTube, um, and you'll be kept up to date on all the latest new trailers and, and scenes, clips, and that sort of stuff that you guys have on on all of your other projects. Yeah. And of course, um, uh, and of course, uh, you know, FrankieFilms.com. You can go there and check out your past, uh, your past work, past projects. Of course, Hall yes. is available uh, everywhere across Canada on all major VOD platforms, including Rogers, Bell, Telus, Shaw, uh, MTS, and I'm missing Kojiko. Thank you, and uh, and uh, also uh, as well on digital HD, uh, available through iTunes, Google Play, and uh, and YouTube. Um, so make sure you do check out Hall. It's a fantastic movie. It's beautifully shot. It's an amazingly claustrophobic experience and uh, a, a terrifying one, both from a zombie viral point of view as well as a uh, as some other theme themes that are running through through the uh, through the movie and the fragility of the and the terror of the human condition as well. Um, but uh, listen, uh, Francisco, thanks so much for for joining. I, I really appreciate you coming on. I know it's a huge commitment to commit a whole day to this. Um, but uh, thanks for sharing these stories, man. I, I'll never forget that Hugh Jackman story. Yeah, that's a, I knew we were gonna I knew we were gonna like that one. I, <laughs> <laughs> one day when uh, when we got when we get together for a beer, uh, when things get back to normal, we'll uh, I'll share a few other ones because I definitely have some other ones I got. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's how he's, I, he's 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 making sure we do a good job on this release. So I yes. need to go and rent it, and that's that's how I get the yes. fast bender stories, that's, you know. <laughs> the fast bender stories. Exactly. <laughs> those, are, those are like the holy grail of yeah, <laughs> stories. Yeah, uh, no, and I know they're uh, good because he's because he's holding out on me, right? So yeah, uh, um, exactly. But uh, thank listen, you. Uh, stick around. We're just gonna go off the air. Uh, don't go anywhere. Yeah. I just want to catch up uh, on a couple things just before we go. But uh, yep. uh, I'm just gonna leave everyone. Uh, say th hey, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, just our uh, doing our a little bit of due diligence to tell everyone to hey, listen, you know what? Stay safe. Help out. Uh, please wear a mask, wash your hands, practice social distancing, distancing, and most importantly, check in on family and friends. Uh, we are in lockdown still here in Ontario for the most part. I think it's province-wide now, uh, and it is uh, it is challenging for a lot of people. But listen, if we all stick together. I know it's month 13. I know it's like, oh, God, when is this going to end? But if we all stick together and kind of do what we need to do and chip in, hopefully we can get out to the other end. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can get there uh, quicker, uh, sooner rather than later. So um, thanks, yeah. everyone else, for uh, st sticking around and, and joining in. And, again, Francisco, don't go anywhere. Uh, I got, I'll talk to you on the other yeah. side. But uh, for everyone else tuning in, thank you so much. And we'll see you in thank two you weeks guys. with our next guest on Takeover Tuesday.